Well, I'm joined now by the Shadow Leveling Up Secretary, Lisa Nandy. Uh, and Lisa Nandy, what do you make of, of, of this idea? Do you, it is a good idea, is it not, to encourage people to own their own homes? In, in principle, it's a great idea to try to get more people the security of their own home, particularly people who find themselves in the benefit system. The problem is that, as always, the government hasn't thought through the detail. There's no sign that any of the lenders are on board with this. The government can say that it wants to open up mortgages to people on housing benefit, but unless the lenders agree to do it, it's not going to happen. There are real practical problems as well. If you're to qualify for universal credit, you've got to have savings of less than 16,000, which mean that most people who the government are trying to reach with this announcement are not going to have anything near the amount that they need for a deposit on a home in order to qualify for that mortgage. The government does have form on this. They've done it before. They said a few years ago that you wouldn't need um, a building fire safety certificate on your home in order to qualify for a mortgage if your home was below 18 metres. The mortgage lender said, well, we still demand one, and it made absolutely zero difference. So, great idea, but absolutely unworkable in practice because the government hasn't, as usual, done the legwork and thought through the details. So, what would Labour's alternative be? Because we do have a problem with people struggling with home ownership in the UK? I mean, there are things that you can do immediately. You could speed up um, measures to um, crack down on unfair leasehold charges. That's something we're proposing today ahead of the housing debate that Michael Gove and I will be having later today in Parliament. We should be taking more action to increase the supply of affordable homes. In the end, that is the only way to really solve the housing crisis for most people. The measures that the government announced today um, w won't begin to do that for most people. And in fact, some of them will make the housing supply crisis even worse. One of the things that Michael Gove has done that is positive is make some funding available to bring brownfield sites back into use. That would open up land to enable properties to be built, but the government has been far too slow at getting that money out and enabling it to be used so that we get those homes built. They're the sort of measures that the government ought to be focusing on if they really want to solve the housing crisis for most people. Uh, in, in, a, in a broader sense about levelling up, other than Northern Ireland, London is the only economy in the UK uh, which uh, it's has seen uh, increases below pre-pandemic levels. What would Labour be doing to ensure more levelling up there? We've got to get we've got to get good jobs back into parts of the country that have seen them bleed out of our communities for the last 40 years. There is no substitute for it. The government is handing out small pots of money, which yesterday a select committee of MPs issued a very damning report about saying that the government had squandered billions and billions of pounds of our money on these small pots of cash that are being doled out around the country that we have to compete for Hunger Games style in order to, to try and spruce up our high streets. The reason high streets are struggling, the reason town centres are struggling is because people haven't got money in their pockets. There are short-term measures that the government could take to deal with that. We've called for an emergency budget and a spike in the national insurance hike to try and help people right now. But long-term, they've got to get investment back into other regions of the UK in order to get those good jobs back. It's why these measures that they've taken in the last few weeks around um, carving the bus subsidies, um, about cancelling Northern Powerhouse Rail, about scrapping parts parts of the High Speed 2 link that would have helped to alleviate congestion on our rail lines in the north of England. These are so short-sighted because it harms private sector investment and it harms economic growth. But also things that could be seen to harm that are, are rail strikes, which are coming up at the end of the month. And, and you've got people who are now finally going back to work in the office after a couple of years of living with COVID. You've got people who are really struggling to make ends meet. How do you think they're going to fare when, when they can't get into work at the end of June? Because the rail unions are already talking about striking, uh, you know, with, without even really sensibly talking about it. Well, well, I hope they will be able to get into work because if the government were to be proactive about this and bring the rail workers and the rail bosses together, I'm confident that we could find a solution. In the end, the solution for the public is not to run down the people who work on our railways, who kept that service going during the pandemic, who turn up for work day in, day out to help people get around. I know from my own experience, you know, my dad is in his 80s travelling on the railways. He couldn't do it without the support of those people who work really hard for very low wages but, to but make so it those, happen. But so do many of those using the trains. Well, that's right depend upon that's, those trains. That's, they too are working really, that's, really hard. That's absolutely right. They, they deserve a good rail service and that means that the government has to uh, avoid these strikes by sitting 
down with rail bosses and rail workers and reaching an agreement, not just attacking the people who run our railways over and over again, as they have done for a decade. It hasn't worked. It hasn't helped. It's had a devastating effect, not just on our rail workers, but on the passengers as well who use those rail services. And we deserve better than that. But when you talk to a, to a lot of passengers, um, they're furious about this. They, they, are, they don't feel a great deal of sympathy, especially in the South East. You know, we've had all the, the big rows about whether, whether or not guards should be on trains. Uh, and passengers don't necessarily, many of them, feel that, that it's a justified reason to be going out on strike. Well, we've had that row about keeping the guard on the train up and down the country. And people feel very strongly that they want to see the guard on the train. If you're a woman travelling late at night, if you're an older person, someone with disabilities, the guard is incredibly important for you. And, you know, in Greater Manchester, we had a terrorist incident. We don't want to see those people who are responsible for our safety and security on trains um, removed uh, or attacked by the government. We want to see the government treat our rail workforce properly, come to a sensible agreement to make sure that those people and their families can eat and keep their heads above water and stay afloat and keep our rail services going. This is perfectly possible. It can be done, but it takes goodwill and it takes a government that is proactive and is focused on the things that matter, not squabbling amongst themselves. On the cost of living, of course, we're talking about fuel as well this morning, prices going up at potentially over £100 for a, for a family car. Uh, we spoke to Michael Gove a short while ago. He said that, that the government's going to be keeping a close eye, especially on supermarkets. Uh, what would Labour be doing to try to get these fuel prices down? I mean, I think, I think this is the biggest issue in relation to fuel, is that we had a 5p fuel duty cut, and much of that doesn't appear to have been passed on by the retailers to consumers. If I were in government right now, we would be coming down like a ton of bricks on those retailers, particularly those who are sitting on that money, uh, not passing it on to customers, because they're waiting to see what happens with petrol prices in future. They don't want to raise prices again, and so they're sitting on that money just waiting to see what happens. That's just not good enough when people are really struggling. As far as I know, the business secretary has only written once to those retailers to, to ask them to pass the fuel duty price on. I'm not sure if any of them even bothered to respond. So the government, you really, like to see them? the government ought to be calling them in and saying to them, there is a crisis affecting people in this country right now and that fuel duty cut must be passed on to customers. And they ought to be bringing forward an emergency budget. I suspect that they probably will now. We told them they needed to bring in a windfall tax to get money into people's pockets and off their energy bills and they finally accepted that they would. Today the Prime Minister's team are briefing that he's going to say in the coming weeks there will be some action to tackle the rising cost of living. We would say to them spike that rise in national insurance contributions as your first priority. We are the only major economy in the world to be putting up taxes on working people in the middle of an inflation crisis. It's just not good enough. It has to be scrapped. OK, also this week, the other big political story, of course, Boris Johnson fighting for his political career. There was the big vote on Monday. Uh, let's just remind our viewers uh, about what Michael Gove said about this a moment ago. How did you vote for him this week? Did you, did you give him your, your support on Monday? Enthusiastically, yes. Uh, I think that it's... Because you've not always been an enthusiastic friend or supporter, have you? No, I, I made a mistake in 2016, um, uh, 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 a misjudgment. Um, if you've been in politics for a little while, as I have been, then, um, you know, there are always mistakes that you can look back on. But no, I think the Prime Minister is doing a good job. So you wouldn't run against him as a potential new leader? Oh, God, no. Uh, he wouldn't run against uh, Boris Johnson. But what about Keir Starmer? That there's been quite a lot of criticism of yesterday's uh, Prime Minister's questions, the fact that he didn't really attack the Prime Minister at all about what had happened over the week, that he's not really holding the Prime Minister's feet to the fire. We're talking about a, a Conservative leadership contest, but should there be a Labour one? No, absolutely not. The, Keir Starmer yesterday was talking about the issues that matter to people in the country. The Prime Minister is doing a good enough job of sabotaging himself and his own reputation, and that row will continue to run within the Conservative Party. That is a tragedy for the country when we need a government focused on the issues that matter to most people, the rising cost of living, the growing waiting lists for cancer treatment. These are things that keep families awake at night, and Keir is absolutely absolutely right, to use our platform as the official opposition to raise those issues with government and to set out plans that we would take to tackle them in the hope that the government will take them up now. But if they won't, we will fight for those at the next general election and put them into practice as the next Labour government. OK, Lisa Nandy, thanks very much Thank for coming you. in this morning.